Hey guys, um, I hope you've watched the first part of the video. Let us move on to the second part. Um, this is gonna contain the gram positive bacilli, the gram negative bacilli, and other um, miscellaneous bacteria which are important but they're less important than the ones we already studied in the part one. So, alright, let's move ahead with this one. Okay, so gram positive bacilli. Um, bacilli are rod-shaped organisms. Um, there are basically four of these which you need to remember and especially these three which are really important for the test. They are Bacillus, Clostridium, Listeria and Corynebacterium. So just remember these two, um, I'm sorry, um, these two are um, the spore-forming bacilli and the other two are non-spore-forming. Um, you gotta remember this one because you can get a lot of questions on these like which of the following is spore forming Which of them does not form spores and you're gonna have some of the other from these options. So That you gotta remember which one forms spores and which one doesn't so maybe if you write it down on a piece of paper for five six times Then probably you'll remember it or if you find out some trick or something do let me know because I couldn't find one Okay, coronary bacterium diphtheriae this is a non-motile organism. One thing which you gotta remember about this is it, it is club-shaped. Just remember, Corynebacterium bacterium diphtheri is club-shaped. It causes upper respiratory tract infections and one of the most common one is called diphtheria. Yeah, what happens in diphtheria is it's, it's gonna cause, it, uh, the typical feature for diphtheria is the presence of a pseudomembrane. And what's a pseudomembrane? It's in the back of the oropharynx near your, your soft palate region and those those areas there's gonna be necrotic whitish to grayish colored you know um, slough like tissue that's 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 called a pseudomembrane that's gonna form this is a typical feature of diphtheria and this can be fatal because if it if it grows in size then it can block the airway so you know the toxicity of these uh, bacteria is because of the um, toxin it produces, the diphtheria toxin. Now, how is this toxin produced? Um, there's a bacteriophage which gets inside, it puts its own DNA, its its genome and everything inside the bacterium, inside the corny bacterium diphtheria, because it undergoes lysogenic cycle and then, you know, just kind of remember it like that. Um, it then produces uh, the toxin, you know, it, it is it is it is encoded by a bacterium uh, a prophage actually so um, If you ever see a question where there's um, in the question it's given which of the following organism shows its pathogenicity because of lysogenic cycle or Something like because of a prophage or a bacteriophage or something like that and the answer is going to be diphtheria toxin or corny bacterium diphtheria because this is the only organism that we study for the part one which shows this characteristic. So this toxin can reach the heart and cause cardiac failure. I don't think it'd be tested on this one but just I've just put the point if you could ever have a question on this. The second one is bacillus. Um, and then specifically in bacillus, we got to know the bacillus anthracis, the causative organism for anthrax. Um, the spores of anthra anthracis are really difficult to kill and, you know, they can remain like that in soil or air or whatever for many years. So that was one of the reason in the ancient time it was used, not, I wouldn't say ancient, but back many years ago, um, it was used as a biological weapon in many countries. So just a fun fact. So the anthrax toxin, um, it is actually a combination of three enzymes and they're the protective antigen, the lethal factor and the edema factor. You won't be tested much on this one, but I think if you get a question on anthrax toxin or any of these three, then you got to remember it's produced by bacillus anthracis. So um, there's another less important one, bacillus cereus. Um, this one is present in rice and cereals and it causes food poisoning. So if you happen to eat such infected rice um, with bacillus cereus, it's going to cause food poisoning. And uh, not much of a deal, but you got to remember this one. Um, if you want to remember cereus, then you know C-E-R-E -E of cereus and C-E-R-E -E of cereals. You just kind of remember it like that. And we have the Clostridium. Um, um, this is an obligate anaerobe. 
We study two of the species in Clostridium. One of them is C. perfringens and the other one is C. difficile and the third one is C. tetany. So C. perfringens, it's also known as C. velchi, um, is famous for producing the enzyme lecithinase and it's famous to cause gas gangrene or myonecrosis which you see in severely diabetic patients. Um, now what happens is it produces lecithinase. So lecithin lecithinase or alpha toxin, it's going to lyse the RBC. So what happens is when C. perfringens, you get an infection with C. perfringens, it releases lecithinase and then it causes lysis of RBC. So what happens after lysis? You know, RBCs are responsible for transporting oxygen. So when there's less amount of RBC because they've been lysed, then there's going to be um, you know, um, a problem with the um, transport of oxygen. So what happens is the tissues, they become ischemic because they don't get oxygen and wherever there's ischemia, there's going to be necrosis. So that's how gas gangrene happens. And you got to remember the other name for gas gangrene, that's myonecrosis, because you can get a question asking about myonecrosis as caused by which of the following organisms. Don't get confused, myonecrosis is nothing but gas gangrene. And it's caused by C. perfringens or C. velchi. Remember these two names because they can confuse you with the other one too. So the second clostridium which we're going to study is C. difficile. It's a normal flora of the bowel, but you know, in favorable conditions is going to attack you. And those favorable conditions for the bacteria are antibiotics. If you happen to take a long-term antibiotics for various things, you can get antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And the cause for that is C. difficile. And if you happen to have pseudomembranous colitis, that C. difficile is going to cause pseudomembranous colitis. So if you, and this is tested on a lot, these two points, if you happen to have any of these in the question or in the option then it is 110 percent going to be related with c difficile you know antibiotic associated diarrhea and pseudomembranous colitis both of them just blindly you can put the answer as c difficile third one c tetany uh the famous one to produce tetanus um it produces an uh, enzyme or toxin called tetanospasmin causes spastic paralysis. Uh, what is spastic paralysis is the muscles and they they are in a constant contracted state you know in a spasm so and because of that what happens is the muscles of mastication especially the masseter is going to be in a constant um, contracted state so as we all know when masseter contracts it's going to close the primary closure of the mandible so what happens is going to lock the joint that position that's the reason it's called lockjaw. So if you get a question asking about lockjaw, it's nothing but tetanus. Um, then we have the C. botulinum. This one, you can get few questions about the botulin toxin, um, that it can be inactivated by heat, and it's the most dangerous toxin in the world. You want to get a question about this? It's just a fun fact. One nanogram can kill a human being. Oh, that's really dangerous. But you can be tested on this line that it can be inactivated by heat. You know, you can get various different types of questions. You, either they can ask you directly or they can put up a case scenario like, um, you know, it, the bottle and toxin C. botulinum happens to be around food and infected meat and such stuff. So, you know, they can get a question format saying that a person ingested some kind of meat and... Um, after some time, um, you know, he happened to be, you know, in a flaccid paralytic state. So what can be the cause for it? So that's going to be C. botulinum or botulin toxin. Or they can ask the other way around, like, how could he have prevented that, you know? But he could have prevented that if he had actually cooked the food before eating or you know boiled the food before eating so what's gonna happen is when you boil the food which has botulin toxin or which is infected by C botulinum the toxin is gonna be inactivated by heat so you know you can be safe from botulism um, in the rarest chance if you ever get a question uh, with the difference between tetanus or botulism 
then the major difference is botulism causes flaccid paralysis that is the muscles and the arms and legs they are floppy you know you can't move them and tetanus it causes spastic paralysis the muscles are going to be in a constant spasm so if someone happens to ask you which is more dangerous then tetanus is going to be more dangerous than botulism we go through gram-negative bacilli, one of the most important family which we most encounter in the questions is Enterobacteriaceae and the two types of organisms are the normal flora which live in which live in your abdomen, your stomach and intestines and all those all those areas and they're the pathogens. Normal flora are E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter and Proteus and the pathogens are Shigella or Shigella, Salmonella, Vercinia and some strains of E. coli don't think that these guys are innocent because they can also cause a disease you know in favorable conditions like as we talked earlier in antibiotics or maybe in immunocompromised conditions or if the person has got cancer and he's undergoing chemotherapy or something like that so these guys are not innocent they can cause problems klebsiella is important because it causes um, you know, uh, pneumonia in immunocompromised patients, especially in patients who have AIDS. So you can go, you can get Klebsiella pneumonia in patients with AIDS. So we go through Shigella. It causes Shigellosis, which is also known as dysentery. Dysentery is um, just remember two features of dysentery: that is severe abdominal cramps and massive diarrhea. You know, lot of diarrhea. So it is an obligate human pathogen. It cannot grow in anything else but humans. Transmission is fecal-oral. It's not killed by stomach acids. Of course, it's not going to be killed by stomach acids. Otherwise, it would have never caused abdominal cramps. It would have never passed into the intestine and caused the disease if it was already killed by the stomach acids. We go to E. coli. E. coli, you got to remember just one thing that's being tested on a lot. That is, it causes, it's the most common causative agent of UTI in females. You know, we earlier studied in the first part of the video that Staphylococcus saprophyticus also causes UTI in females. But E. coli is the one that's the main culprit that's going to cause the most cases of UTI in females. So the way I remember it is, you know, E. coli is a normal flora of the abdomen. And abdomen is more close to the genital urinary tract than the skin you know the staphylococcus saprophyticus are present on the skin so remember it this way e coli are going to be more close to the genital urinary tract so they can cause uti more than uh, staphylococcus saprophyticus because they're present to the skin so the organism would have to travel through the skin into the bloodstream go to the genital urinary tract and then cause the disease whereas e coli it's going to be easy because it's already sitting way close to the genital urinary tract so just this is kind of story which you could remember um a difference between the diarrhea caused by e coli and shigella is um there's actually no difference you know the both of them cause bloody diarrhea so it's re really difficult to clinically diagnose them you gotta have blood tests done we go through salmonella salmonella typhi salmonella paratyphi the causative organism for typhoid and Paratyphoid. Nothing much to remember in this except for this Vidal test. You don't need to go into detail about Vidal test right now because you're not going to get a question on how do you perform the Vidal test or what is it used for. Normally, if you see Vidal test, you're, I'm sure you're going to see typhoid in the options. So <laughs> you can blindly put typhoid, you know, because this is a diagnostic test for uh, typhoid. Um, other gram-negative bacilli, there's Vibrio, just remember it causes cholera. Another fact which you, you, you can remember, but I have not seen it much in the questions. It, um, it, it, it is the fastest motile bacterium, you know, it moves by a darting motion. It shoots in a particular direction, you know, it's the fastest organism. Uh, Helicobacter pylori, it causes peptic ulcers, stomach ulcers, and you know, ulcers in the uh, stomach and everywhere. This one, you gotta remember because you can get testlets on, you know, there's gonna be a section in the exam with testlets. So testlets, uh, they're gonna be questions about uh, the patient has peptic ulcer disease or something. So you can get a sub question inside that saying, what is the organism that causes peptic ulcers? So it's gonna be Helicobacter pylori. 
we go through pseudomonas not much important but just remember humans have to be very 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 immunocompromised to get an infection with pseudomonas because humans are very resistant to it Bordetella pertussis it causes whooping cough just remember it's a part of the DPT vaccine DPT vaccine is diphtheria pertussis and tetanus given together and there's a question which is asked a lot of times in the exams it can ask um, what is the most common vaccine given to children in United States so that is DPT vaccine just remember it actinomycetes they're a special type of bacterium um, they are earlier when they were found out people thought they were fungus but they're not fungi they just appear like fungi you know they've got long filamentous ends so it looks like a fungus so that's the name mycetes mycium or mycetes is always related to a fungus but not in this case if you see actinomycetes or actinomycosis it's not a fungal infection it's a bacterial infection they can test you um, on this thing too that actinomycetes is a dash so the options are going to be parasite virus bacterium or a fungus so you know if you see mycetes it doesn't mean it's going to be fungus actinomycetes is a bacterium Two important species, A. Israeli and A. Neslandii. It's anaerobic. It causes actinomycosis. Now, other names which can be tested on or which can be given in the exam are lumpy jaw or cervical facial actinomycosis. They're the same thing. Mostly, they're going to ask you about lumpy jaw. So, why is it called lumpy jaw? Because actinomycosis causes multiple cutaneous abscesses in the area of the angle of the mandible or you know in the lower border of the mandible and everything it causes many abscesses with sinus tract formation so it's a typical clinical diagnostic feature of actinomycosis because it's going to cause abscess with a sinus tract you know the, you're going to see many holes in the skin that's going to represent the sinus tract um, when you take a pus from the um, abscess and you put it on a slide and if you watch the slide at a particular angle you're gonna see small granules you know yellowish colored granules or you know dots on the slide you know those are sulfur granules it's a typical feature of actinomycosis you're not gonna find this on any other thing it's just seen in the pus collected from actinomycosis abscess histologically it is called ray fungus appearance not much of an importance but just remember ray for ray fungus it's uh, actinomycetes rickettsia um, it's the most common organism. It's the organism which causes rocky mounted spotted fever. Really common in America. 95% of the rickettsial diseases um, in America are rocky, rocky mounted spotted fever. There are arthropod vectors. This can be tested on and this one is tested on a lot. Obligate intracellular parasite. Rickettsia and chlamydia. Both of them are obligate intracellular parasites. You get a lot of questions on rickettsia and chlamydia saying, um, are they intracellular parasites or extracellular or they're anaerobic or aerobic or what it is. So just remember rickettsia and chlamydia, both of them are intracellular parasites, obligate intracellular parasites. Coxella burnetii, just the causative organism for Q fever. Just remember Q fever is caused by Coxella burnetii. Chlamydia, as we talked earlier, obligate intracellular parasite an important one C trachomatis it causes infectious you know infectious um, cause of blindness the most common cause of blindness is C trachomatis and um, you can get a question on which is the most reported sexually transmitted disease or which is the most common sexually transmitted disease in the United States and the answer is not going to be gonorrhea or AIDS it's going to be chlamydia chlamydia is the most common and most reported sexually transmitted disease in the United States yeah there are a lot of cases of AIDS but chlamydia is more common than AIDS and gonorrhea both so spirochetes um, one important one is treponema pallidum the causative organism for syphilis these two lines which have different colored over here they're really important because um spirochetes they cannot grow on any culture medium you cannot take a tissue from the patient a lesion from the patient send it to biopsy and expect that it's going to grow on a culture medium no it's not going to grow it does not have any 
you know, does not have any particular medium in which it's going to grow. It requires dark field radiography. I mean, I'm sorry, I put radiography. It should be microscopy. It requires dark field microscopy to be observed. So, three stages of syphilis. Don't need to get into detail about the other symptoms of syphilis. They're going to test you about these a lot. What happens in the primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, and tertiary syphilis. So primary syphilis, um, the lesion is called a chancre. It's a painless ulcer. You can see it on your penis or near your vagina. Uh, the genital tract, you know. Um, the secondary stage of syphilis, there's maculopapular rash, especially on the torso, your chest and back. And the typical lesion, other lesion is called the condyloma lata. Um, and this is the most infectious stage of syphilis. You know, you can get a question on that too. This is uh, the most infectious stage of syphilis, the secondary stage. The tertiary stage, it's the lesion is called the gamma. The other types of syphilis are congenital syphilis and neurosyphilis. Congenital syphilis is the baby gets it when the mother already has syphilis and she gives birth to a baby so it's going to transmit to the baby vertically so that is congenital syphilis common features clinical features are the baby is going to present with mulberry molars when the molars erupt and peg laterals another one is neurosyphilis if um just remember um argyle robertson pupils it's not much tested on it's okay if you don't remember this Okay, that was the end of the slide for the bacterium. So these are the most important bacteria I've put um, uh, in my slide. I think this this was what I did for my test and I was pretty confident on the, on the test. I got like the whatever questions I got on bacteria, I was pretty confident because this was what, this is how much I studied, you know. Don't run behind a lot of information about, you know, culture, media and everything because that's not required. You don't need to do so much on it. This much is more than enough. I would say I, I bet you could you couldn't get a question out of these. So um, just prepare these and you're good to go for bacteria. And thank you for watching the video. And if you like my videos, do like, comment on the video, share the video to your friends and colleagues, and do subscribe to my channel for more videos on this dreaded exam. Thank you.